Hello, welcome to our episode here on structural and sampling JavaScript profiling, which, to be honest, is a bit of a mouthful. So thankfully, today we have John McCutcheon, who's going to help us make sense of it all. So welcome, John. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions before we get into the meat of the sure. conversation. Yeah. Um, first is, what kind of stuff do you do at Google? And why are you the person to kind of tell us about all of this? All right. Uh, so <clears throat> I work on native client and Dart uh, in DevRel at Google. Uh, focusing on mainly performance. And this is my background coming from PlayStation, where I spent five years doing performance analysis and optimization for games on the PlayStation 3 and the PlayStation Vita. That's, that sounds awesome. So I think you've already partially answered my next question. My next question but uh, what would somebody take away from these tools? Right? Well, why should they care about and know about the difference between a structural and a sampling profiler? So both tools give you insight into what's happening inside your program, where the time is being spent. And that's crucially important when you're making an interactive ac application that you want to run and render smoothly inside of Chrome. All right, fair enough. So I think I'll, I'll kick off with a, a quick overview. And I'll just point out that chances are uh, you are familiar with sampling and structural profiling, right? So structural is also sometimes called, often called, instrumenting profiling. Mm -hmm. And chances are, if you've ever put in a timer, a manual timer, like here's my code, and I want to time how, how much time passes between these two, let's say, function calls or anything, that is, in fact, structural profiling. Yes. Right? Yes. That, so that's what we're talking about. But there's also this other approach, which is sampling, which is something that you guys have probably used in our dev tools. But there's a slight difference between the two. Yes, uh, there, there is. I mean, the first difference, I mean, it, it's, it's just in their names. Uh, sampling is, is taking samples at a, at a fixed frequency, whereas instrumenting or structural profiling is measuring the execution flow across right. time. And there are some good pros and cons to both. Yes, you, you need both. Right, you exactly. don't use one or the other. Yeah, and I guess the, the other takeaway for, for the structural profiling is, as I said earlier, chances are you've done it yourself, but you know, chances are you've logged something to your console, like a timer or something mm -hmm. else. Whereas with Chrome Tracing, we actually have a tool uh, that will allow you to kind of introspect and do yes, be better yeah. analysis. So <clears throat> instead of just doing this st structural or instrumenting profiling where you're logging something to the, to the console, you can actually do many nested structural uh, or instrumenting profiling runs and have it outputted onto a timeline track inside Chrome. Yep. Awesome. So let's get right into it and, and talk about, I guess we'll start with the differences or explain <coughs> what the yeah. two approaches so are. Yeah. So with, with anything that you're trying to measure, it's important that you understand exactly what you're measuring and how that is related to the, the bigger problem that you're trying to solve. So a sampling profiler works like this. At a fixed frequency, your JavaScript program is instantaneously paused, and the call stack is sampled. So if we look at the code snippet on the left of the slide, you can see that the program is calling foo, and foo calls bar. So if in the instant that the sample comes in is maybe when the program is inside bar, as you can see here, the data that comes out of the sample is on the right side. It's the call stack, which is the hierarchy of function calls at the moment that the sample uh, was taken. <coughs> so, so this is the VM being paused right in inside of this function. Exactly. Right, OK. Yes. So the VM pauses your program, looks at which functions are on the stack, and captures this and saves it into a buffer. So you can see exactly as you can read from the code, program calls foo, and foo calls bar, and then that's when the sample is taken. So this gets logged. Another perspective that you can look <coughs> at a sampling CPU profiler is that over time. So here we have a timeline, uh, time running across the x-axis. And a sample is taken. And the call stack there is represented with a rainbow of colors. And a millisecond ticks by, and another sample is taken. And again, another millisecond goes by, and a sample is taken. A millisecond goes by, your program is paused for an instant, the call stack is captured, and it's logged. And the millisecond is just a hardwired value within V8. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. Uh, sampling profilers can work on any frequency, some at a very, very high frequency. Chrome's is at a, is at a reasonably high frequency of 1,000 hertz, uh, or once per uh, millisecond. Um, the, the issue with a sampling profiler that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is that in between these samples, you have no idea of what is actually happening inside of your program. So you could very easily 
miss or uh, misreport a hot code path that just happens to be executing off the sample interval. You can kind of go out of phase. Your code could go to phase with how it's being sampled. Right. And of course, I guess one of the assumptions is if you sample long enough or if you <coughs> make sure that your workload is representative, you should be able to cache it. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, if you, if so long as your workload is uniform and representative of what you're trying to measure, right. um, if you sample over a long enough period of time, the timing data that you get out of the sampling-based profiler will approach that of reality. Uh, what you miss, though, with the sampling-based profiler is that there's no sense of flow. There's no sense of, I was here, and now I'm here, and now I'm here, because these gaps are huge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so once the samples are collected and the data has been processed, what you get out of it is two data points per function uh, that was observed executing in your program during the capture. The first is what is called a leaf of a call stack, and this is the function that was at the top of the stack. It's marked in blue here, which is bar, exactly like the code snippet that we're showing on the left. Underneath of bar are two other functions. One is program, which is just the main entry into your JavaScript code. And the one above that is foo. These are what we call um, inclusive functions. So they're, they're not leafs, but they're part of the call stack. And so they're, in a sense, executing, mm -hmm. but they're not doing the work. The function right. that's doing the work is the leaf or the blue function. Right. In so this, this case. is a nested call in here. So foo is on the outside. So when we pause it inside <coughs> of bar, that's my exclusive time. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You're, you're, you're doing work in bar, but foo is responsible for triggering that. Yep, makes sense. So on the other hand, uh, we have structural CPU profilers. And what these do is they record the entry and exit times of every function in your program. So <clears throat> if we have the same program here again where foo gets called and then foo makes a nested call to bar, we have our buffer, and we see, OK, we've entered foo, so we're going to record the timestamp which we've entered foo. We enter bar, so we record that timestamp. Right. We leave bar, and so we record the timestamp of when we left. And now we've left foo, and we're back at the program. Mm -hmm. When this buffer is processed, it gives us uh, three data points per function. The first is inclusive time. This is the actual amount of time a function was executing for including time spent inside of its children. Uh, and then there's exclusive time. And again, these are analogous to exclusive and inclusive samples. Sure. But samples, again, don't represent time. Um, so exclusive time is just the time that the function was executing. So <coughs> it's, it's the amount of time it's executing minus the amount of time that its children were executing for. Right. So in this case, when you talk about structural, right, the example that you showed, you were recording the <coughs> entry and exit points. Yes. Which, you know, we're just assuming that that somehow magically happens. So, so something has instrumented our code yes, to record yes. this. And we will get to how that magic works. Right. <coughs> but I on. guess the, the point here, before we even get into how we instrument our code to gather that data, is that unlike the sampling, here we are recording every instance of every call. Yes. You're calling every, you're logging every call in return, right. <coughs> which happens at a much higher frequency than 1,000 hertz. Right. So I would have the exact count <coughs> of how many times I've called foo and bar, and I yes. could even have the time deltas for each one. You could one. have the time deltas. You could have the min, the max, the standard deviation. Right. I mean, you could gather a lot of statistics about what's happening right. inside your program. Which I think also kind of hints at something that we're going to cover a little bit further, which is you know, there are different costs to doing this sort yes. of profile. Because uh, structural CP profiling occurs at a much higher frequency, <coughs> there's just naturally a higher cost associated with that. Right. OK. Interesting. So yeah, uh, just in summary, we get the inclusive time, which is time spent inside of the function and its children. Exclusive is discounting the time spent inside of the children. And then the call count, which is exact. Mm -hmm. So once you've found an area of your program that is the bottleneck and you want to improve it, the goal of optimization is to minimize the inclusive time of a function. So that includes time spent inside the children of the function, which is just intuitively what we all understand optimization right. to be. Although you, something that you said at the beginning, which is once you've found yes. the function, right? <coughs> once you've found, yes. Right. So how do we, how do we find? Well, we're going to get into that. OK. We're, we're going to uh, discuss how we can figure that out. But of course, it involves using a sampling and a structural profiler. Right. 
So the question becomes, what do you use? And the answer to that question is you use both. They're both very valuable tools to have in your toolbox. Of course, they both come with their own pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So as I've already touched on, sampling doesn't actually give you any measurement of time. It's giving you a measurement at an instant. Right. Whereas structural or instrumenting profiling, it's built around the idea of measuring slices of time. Mm -hmm. So you get an exact measurement of time. Where sampling, you can get an approximate kind of attribute a weight to every sample yep. and, and, and extrapolate to time. Invocation count, invocation count, again, it's approximate with sampling because it's only once every millisecond that we're sampling. Yep. So you could be called a thousand times between those two points sure. in time and miss them. Yep. Structural, you get exact. Something that you were hinting at, which is the overhead. Sampling is a very, very low overhead. It's guaranteed because it's at a fixed frequency, your program is paused, the call stack is captured, and it's resumed. Right, so this is specifically for like a CPU overhead. Yes, right? CPU overhead, yep. yes. Whereas structural, because it's at such a higher frequency, uh, the data being collected in structural profiling is cheaper to compute. It's cheaper to compute the time than to extract the call stack. Sure. But the rate at which you're doing that work is so much higher with the structural profiler. Yeah. Although even that depends, right? Because so an example that you showed earlier, we were recording every entry to every function or every entry in every exit. Mm -hmm. But if I only care about like one specific piece of code and I just need like yes. an entry and exit point, then in, if that's the only thing I'm instrumenting, then maybe that's not that bad to be yeah. able to. No, absolutely. In a manually instrumented system, you can reduce and minimize the overhead of structural profiling right. by moving it around. Yeah. And depending on which mechanism you use, you, c you could end up in a scenario where it could be, in fact, incredibly expensive, which is then your code may actually suffer from like an observer effect, right? Yes. Just, yes. just because you're looking at it with this it's instrumentation, slower, it, yeah. right? It's, it's, exhibiting completely different behaviors than from what you're seeing in the in a while. Yes, yeah. Right? I mean that's that's something that just in general with all uh, optimization and kind of measurement techniques with programs is sometimes the very act of measuring and observing the state of your program right. impacts not only the behavior but the performance. Yep. Those are always fun ones to uh, track yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can you subtract that from the data? Yep. I don't know. Um, so overhead, very low sampling high to low with uh, structural, but you're in control with structural uh, profiling, how high that overhead is. Mm -hmm. In terms of accuracy, it's marked with, marked with asterisks. It's a bit of a gray area. Right. It's hard to say which one is more accurate. I mean, sampling, it's just measuring samples. So mm -hmm. it's incredibly accurate at measuring samples. But a lot of people have a tendency to extract from samples time. And that's where you, it becomes very inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for structural, you know, if you are not instrumenting the right thing, then you may have missed the actual picture. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah, you and if you instrument everything, then you may actually suffer from this observer effect. Exactly. So it it really depends. Yes. Right? Yeah. The answer is always depends yeah. for accuracy. <laughs> and use both. And use both. And use and both. Iterate right. and and play with it. Yep. Um, so sampling has one added benefit, which is that. It requires no modification to your program. You don't have to know anything about the structure of your program. You don't have to know where a good place to lay right. markers yep. are. Um, and it just works. You could go to any website, run the sampling profiler, and see where they're spending so their that, time. So that's just a service provided by the VM. Yes, right? We'll exactly. pause you. We'll take a snapshot. Yep. We'll move on. And while it is possible for a VM to also offer structural and instrumenting uh, profiling as a service, V8 does not. Right. Right, so that's specific to V8, actually. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, so in summary, um, instrumenting profilers give you very fine control over like where and what you're measuring, mm -hmm. but it requires that you have implicit knowledge of the code base. And um, you also have trouble instrumenting things that like you haven't written. If you have a right. library or a system call that you're making, you don't want to start going in and, and yeah, laying markers If I'm markers debugging somebody's site, if I just pull that up and it's running kind of slow and I'm curious, yeah. uh, I don't have the ability to instrument the code. Correct. Right? Yeah. It's kind of a non-starter. Yeah. Um, so speaking of which, right? so I guess we should cover very quickly the sampling pro uh, profiler first. And the sampling profiler is built into the Chrome DevTools. So if you open up your DevTools, head into Profiles, you can uh, click Start and record a sample. So actually, let's, let's do just that. So we have the... Uh, V8 uh, benchmark suite here, and I'm going to refresh the page, and it's uh, it's actually running 
the, the suite here. And I'm going to start sampling. All right, so we'll let it run for a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll stop. And here is the actual view of the sampling profiler. Right? So Chrome was pausing the VM once every millisecond, yes. capturing the stack trace. And this is what we're seeing here. Absolutely. And, uh, there is no there's no time sequence here, right? Like you can't really see what was executing when. It's just yeah. it's showing you that hey, thirty five percent of the total time was in this function called That's the leaf function too, actually. Right. Yes. And uh, you don't really get that sense, right? So you're familiar with some some of this code and you can figure that out. Yes. Uh, yeah. but uh, one yeah, it's giving you like thirty five percent, but what's really missing from this is flow. That's right. exactly it. You don't know like what led to that computation. Right. So we do provide a little bit of help um, in that regard, right? So we can actually flip here and, and look at the tree view, mm -hmm. which is going to reorganize all of the data in here. And you can see that you know there's some uh, kind of V8 specific uh, stuff in here. And then we can go to run step, and we can <coughs> we can navigate basically down into this tree. Um, and see what's being called, kind of the, the call stack, if yes, you will. Yeah. But now it's kind of hard to figure out where is the actual time being spent, like really. Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to like fan and drill into this large tree, and then you right. find your hotspot. Right. Maybe. So um, you know, the tool is there; um, it is useful. So another tip that I'll that I'll show is you can actually, you know, th these trees can be very deep mm -hmm. and very hard to work with. So you can actually focus on a specific one and kind of continue drilling down. You can go back. So this functionality is here. You can actually, the one thing that I really like is you can uh, load and export these profiles as well. Yeah, that's so important. Right. If you want to report a performance problem to someone, it's best to show up with a, a capture in some way. That's right. Don't just take a screenshot and, you know, yeah. and point because an arrow. If, I know if, I've if done that. If the screenshot, y you end up giving it to the developer, and the developer's like, oh, I really wish I could see what's under that leaf, which yes. you didn't expand, and the data's gone. Exactly. So export it, attach it to your bug report, attach it to your email. Loaded uh, later into DevTools, and you can, you know, even if you just don't have the time right now to analyze it, you can save it and come back to it later. Yeah. So uh, that's a very brief overview of. Yeah, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about the differences between these two as the talk goes on. Right. So I mentioned some of these, right? And, and I encourage you guys to uh, play with the, the V8 benchmark suite. It's a great place to kind of get a really nice workload where you can see and figure out what's going on. Um, definitely play with the options at the bottom. Uh, the tools there, you know, it's it's good stuff. And now let's look at uh, Chrome tracing. I don't think many people actually know about first know about Chrome tracing yeah. and <coughs> ever connected debugging or profiling with Chrome tracing. Yeah. Um, so Chrome tracing is a it's a hidden site built into Chrome, <coughs> like Chrome Memory or about GPU or something like that. When you navigate to Chrome colon slash slash tracing you are presented with this incredibly deep and detailed view into the guts of what Chrome is doing. So it's kind of overwhelming at first. You look at it, you're like, holy, right. I, I can't make heads or tails of what this sure. is. Um, and in a sense, that's partially because it's not really designed for the end user to be poking around. But what you can do is you can actually inject uh, <coughs> structural or instrumenting profiling data from your own JavaScript code right. into the Chrome tracing view. And so that gives you a really interesting timeline view of what your program is doing, showing the flow across time. But the added benefit is it actually frames it into the larger Chrome context, right. which is completely missing from the sample so based I think profile. The history is also interesting here, right? So Chrome tracing was built by Chrome developers for Chrome developers. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then specifically for the GPU developers who right. want to optimize the low level GPU performance. Right. So if you're building a game, you're trying to figure out what's going on in my render stack and yep. all the rest, that's definitely a tool that you should be familiar with. But I think in the process of just using this tool, uh, we've kind of realized that there's these accidental discoveries of like, well, if we instrument our JavaScript code and we provide a way to uh, show that here, yeah. it allows some very powerful um, debugging yeah. capabilities. Absolutely. I mean, you can go in and really have a, a deep understanding of why your game's running at 30 frames per second rather than six. Right. Um, but so let's let's step through this. Um, but before I do that, I just want to point out that while it is very overwhelming, you can really narrow this view down. You can strip away yep. all of the cruft data that isn't relevant to you. So keep that in mind when you're when you're looking at it in the first place. And we'll we'll show you some tips actually a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. So how do you use Chrome tracing? The first thing you have to do, which we've kind of touched upon, is that you have to instrument your code. 
And the way you instrument your code in, in order to interface with Chrome Tracing is by making calls to console.time and console.time end. You pass in a string parameter give it, representing the name of the time period that you want to measure. So you can see here we have our trusty, simple uh, example where foo gets called, foo calls bar, and bar does nothing. And you can see that it's been instrumented uh, both at the entry and exit points of foo and bar. Mm -hmm. Yep. This will allow us to understand when foo begins executing and when it finishes. And you can nest them. This is a very important concept is that it's not just one. You can have as many nested as you want. Right. And Chrome Tracing will make sense of it and display it to you in that hierarchy. Yep. So there's lots of different types of instrumentation. We've kind of touched upon the fact that you have to manually instrument your code with V8 uh, in order to interact with Chrome Tracing. But some systems, uh, I think uh, Firefox's profiler does yep. automatic instrumentation. So it's just something to keep in mind that some tools will do this automatically for you, both uh, at compile time and at runtime. Yeah. So actually, just before this, we, we actually looked at Firefox, at Firebug specifically. right? Yep. And when you run profile, when you look at the output, it'll actually tell you the exact call count, yes. which yep. is immediately a tip off that's saying that it's a structural profiler. Yes. Right? Yep. So it's much heavier, uh, but it's giving you a little bit of a different view. So yeah, right. keep in mind that you know these uh, the way the profiling is done in different uh, browsers is also different. No, oh, totally. Right. Uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, like they couldn't be more different. The right. the the Chrome Developer Tools profiler is a sample-based profiler, and the Firebug profiler is a structural profiler, right. and it does automatic instrumentation. Yeah. And it's not a case of either one. Yes. You really need both, right? You which do. is what I like about yeah. uh, having access to both here. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's all on one hood here. <clears throat> so you might wonder about like what are the cost of all of these uh, these uh, markers and instrumentation? Then we keep hinting that there is a cost to it. Yeah. Um, and it's important to note that when Chrome tracing is disabled and the developer console is closed, the cost is almost it's negligible. You won't be able to measure it. It's okay to leave them in there, but when Chrome tracing is on, there a cost sh starts to show up, and it's about 0 0.01 milliseconds sure. measured on my machine. So everyone's machine is going to be slightly different, right. but that allows me to do about 100, uh, 100 markers per millisecond. Right. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, although I, I'll still say that it probably, as a best practice. You should probably remove the console.times from your production code anyway. Like you shouldn't, yes. even though yeah. it's basically inert code. Uh, you know, maybe on IE6 or what have you, right? That may actually throw an error because it has no idea what this is. Absolutely. So um, you should <coughs> probably strip it out. And there's a couple of different ways you could do that. I mean, you could try so and do a. What I, what I do is I have something called push and pop. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can just replace the body of those functions for your production code you with nothing. Right, right. So just wrap your own function around it. Yeah, wrap console time and console time end. Don't call them directly. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So you have a very s simple one place to short circuit all of that logic right. and clear it out. Alternatively, if you're using something like, let's say, Clojure, mm -hmm. you could actually build a filter in there, right, to go in and kind of strip it out. Or yeah, you could be great. even more advanced, something like a Sprima with the J uh, JavaScript parser. You could actually get the AST, yeah. just extract it, and rebuild it. I mean, this is kind of going to the crazy land, but it. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think as. JavaScript applications become like that big and that kind right. of like complex. These sorts of tools will just be employed regularly. So yep. why not just apply it to this? Problem right, and as I well? think it's important to invest into these kinds of tools yes. for your team because you should have this code in there, right? Because it makes everything so much simpler to debug, monitor over time. Yeah, and the rest. I mean, if you, if you can find a way to leave the code in there, like maybe wrapped in some way, so that hey, I've noticed something going slow. Like, Why don't I just click a button and right. get a really good capture without having to worry about going in and laying out the instrumentation again? Yep. Makes yeah, sense. I think best practice, find a way to make sure that that doesn't get called in production. Yep. Yeah. Having your debug data in production is never a good thing. Yes. Yep. So we've instrumented the code. We've added the calls to console time and time end. And now we want to go over to Chrome Tracing and start recording a trace. When you go there, it's going to be essentially a blank page, except there'll be a toolbar along the top with the record button there indicated with the red arrow. Immediately after pressing record, you switch over to your application. It's important that you actually interact with your application while capturing it. Right. Because Chrome will throttle down your page if you're not right. if it's not back, present. Background pages get a lower priority. Yes. Right. Yep. So you want to be like playing with it exactly as a user would be. Yep. After a while, 
you'll switch back to the Chrome Tracing tab and click the Stop Tracing button there. And as you can see, it indicates how much uh, of the buffer you've used. I don't know what the absolute size of the buffer is, but it's quite large. It's quite large, but the amount of data that this actually collects is ginormous. Yes, right? yeah, <laughs> so, it really is. Uh, uh, so don't be like, uh, I've run most of my traces for on the order of maybe 10 seconds, 20 yeah, seconds at most, yeah. right? That's, that's about it, because the nice thing about a structural profiling is you only need one frame. Right. Assuming the frame is representative of, of the average frame, that's all the data you need. Where on the other side, a sample-based profiler, the longer you let it run, yep. the, the more it's going to approach the reality of timings. Right. So when Chrome is actually uh, tracing this, it's actually storing all this data in memory just because it's so much data. Yes. Right? Yep. And I think we'll talk about it later, but actually, well, we have it in the screenshot here. You can also export this trace and then load it up later. Mm -hmm. So. Same story, you can attach it to a bug report, which yes. is great. Please do. If you're going to file a performance bug with anyone, <laughs> provide more data, because it, it gives the developers the input they need to solve the problem. Right. If you just send a screenshot, it's like, it's slow. Well, it's you're probably right, but how does that help the developer solve the problem? Right. Perfect. All right. <clears throat> so. We've done a capture now, and we see this. Again, it's intimidating. It's, it's wild. It, like, you know, I don't know what half of this stuff is. Right. But that's great, because you can just strip it away. Right. So the important thing to note here is that this, so Chrome Tracing does not capture just your tab or the page that you're on, which is what the sampling profiler does when yes. you pull it up in DevTools. Yeah. Uh, this profiler will actually record activity across every single tab, every single process that Chrome yes. is managing. So this also means things like um, I.O. threads, renderer threads, right? So each tab yeah, has yeah. an instance of those. So within a, a tab, you have the renderer thread, which is where like your JavaScript code runs. And then you have a compositor thread, which is like does the interactions with the GPU. I mean, yep. a given tab can have multiple threads off of it. Right. And so for each tab that you have open, you'll have each one of these in here, which is what yes. the rows stand for, right? So yes. the first question is like, well, if I have a couple of tabs open. So for, I guess first tip is close all the tabs. Yeah, <laughs> It'll make yeah, your yeah. life simpler. <laughs> well, and actually, that's a really important thing to note for any types of performance measurement on a PC or Mac or any type of computer is that if you have some other applications, say you're watching a YouTube video in another right. tab or something like that, that has an impact on the execution of your program right. and will kind of muddy the waters of what you're measuring. Right. So you want to kind of like close everything down, keep it really simple, not just within Chrome, but your entire it's OS. It's your lab environment. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you got to yeah. keep it clean. That's right. OK. So how do I yes. so filter some of those noise? The first thing that you want to do is you want to figure out the process ID for your page. And the easiest way to do that is to go to Chrome colon slash slash memory. And there'll be a table of process IDs uh, with tab names. And yep. you find the tab of your, of your application. So you can just search for your tab name there. Yes. And yep. then right next to it is going to be the process ID. And this is going to allow you to filter for the data that you're interested in. So we've already said the, the, the main rows inside Chrome Tracing are keyed off of the process IDs that they're coming from. Yep. So once you've gotten your process ID, Kill all of the other rows. Right, so there, it's maybe a little bit hard to see in the on the presentation, but there's the little X icon beside each of the rows, yes. so you can just kill them, right? So you know the you know the process IDs or PIDs of the ones that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Just close all the rest. Yeah, absolutely. If it doesn't have your process ID uh, next to it, get rid of it. It's fine. Right. And then on top of that, after having done that, you can filter even further. And since we're talking about just profiling JavaScript code. There's a categories box in the upper right corner of Chrome Tracing. And by clicking on that, you can deselect all of the categories of data that were captured that is not relevant to what you're trying to look at. Right. So if we're interested in JavaScript and we don't care about the compositor thread, you can just unclick the renderer and a few yeah, other things. Yeah. So if you're doing just JavaScript profiling, you just want V8 and WebKit. Right. Everything else, turn it off. So immediately, we've kind of come down from that like craziness to something that's far more reasonable, and like you can reason about what what's being displayed in front of you now. Right, right. Um, and then this brings us to the awkwardness of your first initial interactions with Chrome <laughs> Tracing, which it doesn't work as you'd expect, where you can use the mouse and drag around and scroll. It operates based on the Quake keys. So W and S zoom in and zoom out, and A and D pan to the left or to the right. Yep. 
You can press a question key or click the question mark box in the upper right-hand corner, which gives you all of the other keyboard shortcuts. But it's important to just keep in mind that most of your actions are going to be through the keyboard. That's right. Uh, you can, I guess, select uh, kind of segments with your mouse, and it'll yeah. show you a little summary at the bottom of, as to which functions are being called. Yeah, it's like that's kind of like a lasso, and then you get a lot of information about what you've lassoed. Right. But unless you're panning in or panning left and right and zooming in and out, you're not really going to get the high fidelity information that's available. Yeah, yeah I mean, you look at that, um, that, that initial screenshot where it's just like craziness. You can just drill in until each one of those tiny little bars right. fills the screen. Right. Yeah. It, it kind of has an infinite resolution there. You yeah. just keep yeah, drilling. Yeah, I think you're, you're literally looking at kind of nanosecond granularity at, at certain yeah. points. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's really, really, uh, really precise. So why don't we uh, do a walkthrough and do a, a profile of uh, some code with the sample-based profiler and then uh, with the structural profiler. And so we can kind of compare apples to oranges and see the different types of data that you can get from both. <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is a subset of the code that's being executed. There, we have a request animation frame function called game loop, mm -hmm. and game loop calls A, A loops for two milliseconds, and then calls B. And the body of B and C are not shown here, but you can see on the on the table on the right how much time they execute for. So A calls B, and B executes for eight milliseconds, and then B calls C and C executes for one millisecond, and then C calls D, which executes for two milliseconds, and you can see the body of D on the slide. It does nothing but that, and then it just returns, and they all return back up. So it's just a sequence of functions, A, B, C, D, and yes. each one does a little bit of work and then calls the next. Yep, and they're all nested. Right, so the total, like one pass when we invoke A, the total time would be 13 milliseconds once exactly, everything completes. Yeah. yeah, and so looking at this table, you would expect that B is the dominant function. Right. B is taking 8 out of the 13, so that's about 66% or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. so you didn't and, expect it. Right, and we're firing this hopefully every 16 milliseconds, which is exactly. why the 13 milliseconds is important. Yes, yeah. right? if, so. if you want to do an interactive application using request animation frame, it's important that you are operating at 60 hertz. Right. Which inverted is 16 milliseconds. Right, so every, yeah, so f to render each of the frames, you have about 16 milliseconds in which you're yeah. Allowed to do your work. Yeah, well. and we'll get into like the real details of the, that 16 Perfect. milliseconds later on. All right. Um, but ballpark is 16 milliseconds. So we'll swap. We'll switch open the Chrome Developers tool and go to the sample-based profiler and run a sample uh, of this just loop running endlessly for a little while. And then you'll see again here a screenshot on the right showing you that tree of information which we've touched on upon already. But what's really interesting, if you start to dig into it, is you notice that the functions A, B, and C are actually gone. They're nowhere in this capture, which is very right. unusual. Yeah. It doesn't make a lot of sense, considering that B, for example, is taking 66% of our frame time. Right. It's not present in the sample-based capture. And also spin4, which is that leaf function, which is just doing all that spinning, is actually showing up as a very small contributor to the overall uh, execution time. Right. So maybe just to highlight, because I think what you mentioned is very important. So B is the longest function, right? So eight milliseconds here. But as yep. you're pointing mm -hmm. out, you just don't see it. So for some reason, we see D, which is supposedly two milliseconds. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, D is showing up, but B isn't. That doesn't intuitively make sense as to what you would expect the execution flow of your program to look like. Right. Um, so what has happened here is through a, a variety uh, of optimizations, in this case, specifically inlining, the functions A, B, and C, and spin4 have all been inlined into game loop. Uh -huh. So let me explain what inlining is. So inlining is a very common compiler optimization. And if you take a look at the code on the left here, you can see we have a variable x. And we loop 10 times, and we call a passing in x and passing the result back out. And all a does is double the value of x, right. returns 2x out of it. So a compiler will see this and say, hey, you know what? a is so short that I could just put a, the body of a, where the call to a takes place. Mm -hmm. And what this effectively does is it erases a from the program, because it no longer exists by name. Right. The execution and like the side effects of its execution are still present in your program. Mm -hmm. The name of a is gone. So the rule of thumb here is that the code at runtime in V8 does not 
represent the code that you wrote in source code form. So the side effect of this is the call stacks won't actually look, won't necessarily look right. like the ones that you've and expressed. And this is just one optimization out of dozens and dozens that yes. V8 does, right? So, and, and not only that, like V8 is constantly analyzing your program and looking for new optimizations to test out and employ. Right. So even between runs, you may actually have yes. a different, basically a different representation of the code in V8. Functionally, it'll do the same thing, or yes. it ought to be doing the yep. same thing. Uh, but what's actually living inside of a V8 may be very different from what you have in your mind when you're thinking about that code, right? Because yes. I am thinking of B with 8 milliseconds. And I'm trying to math it here, and I'm like, what is going on? Where did it go, right? And right. so in this specific case, it was inlined and erased. But I mean, yeah, like V8 is constantly testing out optimizations. Right. It might take a look at a function and be like, OK, well, it's running at this rate now. Let me try out this optimization. In a second, I'll see if the new optimization is better or not. Right. So it's just constantly changing. Eventually, it hits a steady state. Right. But especially at the beginning, it's very volatile. And not only that, but so this is Chrome. These optimizations may be different in other browsers or in other Great JavaScript point. runtimes. Yes. Yeah. Firefox's optimizations will be different than uh, Safari's optimizations, and they'll be different than Chrome's optimizations. Right. So there's no guarantee that this type of optimization will be employed in another browser. Yep, makes sense. <coughs> so bottom line here is that this trace just doesn't really resemble the application's real execution flow or execution time. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at a uh, at the same program. So again, it's A calling B calling C calling D, but with this time with the structural profiler. Uh, so we've instrumented our functions with calls to console time and console time end. Mm -hmm. um, and keep in mind that these functions, these calls to time and time end and the, the functions A, B, C, and D can still be optimized. They can be optimized however right. the, the VM that you're running in feels like optimizing them. But the marking of time regions will, will not be optimized right. away. So we could take the body of D, inline <coughs> it into the function above it, yeah, yeah. Um, it, and it'll take the console dot time, right? So even, exactly, even though yeah. the code kind of the shape changes, we could be the best compiler ever and right. the best optimizer ever and inline it all, right? But so long as we keep the console time and time ends marking the regions of time that we're interested in, yep. the structural profiler present in Chrome tracing will still show us the flow of sure. time. Maybe one more comment about this: in the example so far, we've always shown um, time and time end within the same function. Mm -hmm. That doesn't have to be the case. Absolutely not. Right. So you I, I can, think this is important. To you highlight. can uh, nest them, and you can cross function boundaries. So what I like to do when I first start off like profiling and optimizing code is like start with a huge ball of code. Right. Go from the beginning of your frame to the end. Yep. Just measure that, and then binary search your way down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. Uh, up above, uh, you can see that there is uh, a timeline view here, and it's kind of like it looks like an inverted pyramid. We have A along the top, and then for less time we have B, and then for less time C, and furthermore. If you were to actually get out and measure this, you could see that A is executing uh, exclusively for two milliseconds, exactly as we've instructed it. Right. It then calls B which executes for 8 milliseconds, and then it calls C, yep. which executes for 1 exclusively. Then it calls D, which executes for 2 exclusively, and then they all return so up. So this is like this is a very direct visual mapping <coughs> of yes. that function. Kind yeah, of it stack. matches our intuition. It's right. exactly what you'd expect to be going on And this here. is, in fact, what you would see in your Chrome tracing if you zoom in on the specific execution of, of this trace, yes, right? Once yes. you've instrumented this. This is a screenshot from Chrome tracing with these exact instrumentations in place. Right. What I find is really interesting is it's hard to see in the screenshot on the right hand side here. Yeah. But you can see that there's a little bit of time from when D returns from when C returns. Yeah, it's almost like a, a, a pixel pixel to the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's exactly what you would expect it to be. Of because course. Once D is returned, C is going to execute for a few more instructions and execute its return statement, and right. so on and so on. Yep. The important thing here is that the exclusive runtime column matches exactly what we've written the code to run for. Yep. And that was not the case with sample-based profiling. Yep. So in conclusion with this, this demo, in this specific case, and we've definitely picked a like worst-case scenario for sample-based profiling, right. 
it didn't present a very clear picture of the program execution flow or the time spent inside a given function. Contrast that with the structural profiler, which mirrored exactly what you'd expect, and yep. the true flow and time of the program's execution. But structural profiling required that we <coughs> first instrument our code, and then t second, master the beast that is Chrome tracing to even be able to look at this data. Right, which kind of leads me to believe that you should probably be using both. Of course, yeah. Always start. Um, always start with sample-based profiling. So here's a walkthrough of like a real-world workflow for profiling. First step, of course, is you just realize something's running slow, mm -hmm. or you're just a very inquisitive person, which is always good. And then you run the sample-based profiler, which is going to highlight the, the big target, mm -hmm. right? It's not going to provide the precision and detail that we saw with the structural-based profiling, but it is going to give you a landmark in your code to start instrumenting right. from. And it's three clicks. Open DevTools, profiling, yes. to start. Yeah. And Could, I, I'm, it I'm couldn't looking. be easier. Right, yeah. and I'm there. Yeah. Yep. So once you have that landmark, then start laying out some of these console time and time ends to uh, kind of mark out regions of execution. Right. So it could, in fact, so I think this is actually important to highlight. So with sampling, let's say I'm calling a DOM API. Mm -hmm. right? I can't really instrument the DOM API in my st structural code. Yes, right? although you could actually instrument around it. Around it, it and, yes. and, and record it, right? But the sampling profiler will actually sh tell me immediately, like if I'm calling some function which is blocking all the time yes. for, for whatever <laughs> reason. That'll show up there. And then you can actually ask a question like, OK, so maybe I'm calling some expensive function in, uh, for CSS or for JavaScript or what have you. What is calling that? Like, yes, what is causing yeah. that? And that's, that's, what, like, that's where the sample starts to kind of get a little like Swiss cheese. Like, you can kind of, kind of see these holes in it, and you're not getting the clear picture. Right. But, and then you start instrumenting around that, that chunk of code. Right. You narrow it in. But that's a great point. The sample-based profiler does show you system calls that you make. Mm -hmm. So if you call like a, a canvas fill or a canvas stroke method or you're modifying the, um, some property of a DOM element which r requires a reflow, that's yep. going to show up in the sample-based profiler. Yep. Perfect. <clears throat> so the key takeaway here is that you start with the sample-based profiler, you then dig in with instrumentation, and you iterate. This is not a one pass. Yeah. You, you repeatedly go over this. It's you know you're slowly building this really detailed map of what your program is doing. Mm -hmm. So, some closing tips. Again, you start with the sampling profiler. You have to learn how to deal with Chrome tracing, which is after maybe one or two attempts at it, it's easy. Right. But yeah. you know the first time, it's kind of. It's intimidating. Yeah, I think what found what I found uh, very useful is just finding a couple of good mm. traces. Yes. Right, yeah. and just kind of wrapping your head around it. So I think you'll show us a quick demo at the end, yeah. which will be uh, very good to see. But also just you know go go into your page, capture something, scroll around, interact with it, record a couple of different ones, and just kind of compare them side by side. Yeah. Right? And so like some <coughs> some interesting flow there. With if you just want to kind of like figure out what's going on, is you want to find like you can have a, a keyboard input, right? Mm -hmm. That will show up inside Chrome tracing right. when a key was pressed. Right. And so if you if you go from there, you can start like following this thread yep. through Chrome tracing. It's like okay, well a key was pressed and, and the browser noticed a key was pressed. That's right. And then it notified my page, and then my page ran my on yep. key down handler. So there's definitely a case of just like information overload. Yeah. Right. Um, initially there, and I guess the other thing that I'll mention is, and I find this incredibly useful. Uh, when you narrow in on that one, let's say, input handler, right? Yep. It'll actually give you like the Chrome name the, from the source code. Yes. So you can actually, most of the time, you can just copy that if you're really curious about it, paste it into your favorite search engine, and you'll end up on like looking at the Chrome yeah, source. Yeah. And I just find reading through the comments very enlightening sometimes. <coughs> yeah, I think that's a great idea. So, uh, absolutely. Um, so, part of this like learning how to deal with it is again filtering down and remember go to chrome memory to get the pid right. and then yeah. just kill all the rows that have nothing to do with your page yep cuz they're just noise for what we're looking at right now um, and we we've kind of touched on a lot of this here but remember that the time and time end pairs can cross function boundaries mm -hmm. they don't have to be within a single function you could do huge like reams of code with just one time and time end yep and narrow in 
And the, <coughs> the V8 optimizer and the optimizers in Safari and Firefox employ a variety of optimization techniques, which ultimately to you means that the runtime representation of your code will not necessarily match your source code. Yep, yep, makes sense. And remember, if you want to, uh, you can exchange these captures both from Chrome Tracing and from Chrome DevTools Sample Based Profiler. And it's a really great idea when you're interacting with developers to provide them with a capture. Yeah. So if, if you're on the receiving end of these things, start asking. <laughs> if you're currently not getting these, start asking for them. Yes. And if yeah. you're the one filing the bug, please include this. <laughs> and just think, if you, if you go through your library and you add in an optional instrumentation pass, yeah. which someone who is running into a performance problem, you could just write back to them, set this flag, run it, give me a capture, yeah. and yeah. email it back to me. <coughs> so the, it reduces this like back and forth time between you and the developer reporting the issue to just one pass. Yeah, yeah. incredibly useful. Yes. So another uh, little tip that I have here is think about the data that's being processed. Let's imagine a scenario where you're iterating over elements in a list, and you're doing some computation on them. Mm -hmm. the, your intuition and your expectation is that the cost per element is uniform. Yep. So cost for element one is the same for two, same for three, same for four. So you'll lay out an instrumentation marker that says, well, I'm processing my list. Right. So, right? Yeah. So be creative with your names. Yes. Yeah, right? Be very creative with your names and include them because the the instrumentation just takes a string, you could name all of your objects and right. pass that string in. So I'm doing work on data item one, two, three, four, five. Oh, six is huge. Right. As you can see in the screenshot, which tells you that maybe the data in six is maybe malformed right. or it's triggering a slow path. Right. So maybe I'm processing a list of users, I can just include the username in here and exactly. be like, yeah. hey, it's you know, data item six or data John yeah, wh is taking why a long is, like why yeah. is John taking so long? And then you're going to dig in, and you're going to find some really obscure bug in your code. Sure, sure. It's yeah, or a if megabyte you, of extra text or something. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> like maybe the the I've been chatting a lot, and the log has gotten huge, and the way right. your algorithm that processes the log is algorithmically slow. So this is important, I think, because most of the time your code could be running just fine, right? Like it's it's, yes, it's staying it's with, with, within. But then every once in a while you get a dropped frame, and you're just scratching your head trying to figure out what the heck's going yeah, on. Yeah. That could be. Uh, that could be the problem, and that's Absolutely, one way to yeah. help you track it down. Yeah. So budgeting, uh, you know, like any good uh, household, you've got a budget for money. You need to budget for performance as well, um, which, in terms of a game or an interactive, like very very responsive application, means less than 16 milliseconds per request animation frame. So let's yes step back. So we have a thousand milliseconds in a second. We want yes. 60 frames per second. Mm -hmm. If you just divide those numbers, we get roughly 16.6 repeated. So yes. 16 frames or 16 milliseconds to get 60 frames. Yes. Right. So that is my budget f to render each frame. Exactly. You have 16 milliseconds to do everything, right. which includes like taking keyboard input, taking mouse input. Right. Uh, which actually brings me to a little side note here. In your input process, in your on key down handlers. Just queue that up and process it in your your request animation frame. Right. That's a much more efficient way of uh, of allowing Chrome to execute. Right. So <clears throat> that aside, um, you have 16 milliseconds, and you have to do everything in it mm -hmm. in order to give Chrome enough time to render your your page at 60 hertz. Right. So and I guess there's some overhead for Chrome itself, like it's not just instant, right? So yes, and we'll we'll highlight that in more detail momentarily, actually. But okay. yeah, it's it's really not 16. It's actually like, let's run down to 14, sure. maybe. Sure. Depending on what you're doing, it could be 13. Right. Or and actually, not only that, but 16 milliseconds is also it's not an absolute time. I'm going to claim that it's a relative time because 16 milliseconds on you know, this computer that I have here is probably very different from 16 milliseconds on my phone. Absolutely, right. And then the same, but in the other direction, with your desktop machine. Right. 16 milliseconds on this might be 10 on a desktop, right. and 28 on a, a phone. Yeah, so if, if you're optimizing your page and you're currently, let's say you're taking 20 milliseconds to do the work, and you've yeah. just managed to get it under 14, and you're, like, you're yeah, happy, yeah. I mean, that's a great win to begin with. But you know, sorry, you should probably get it down even further 
to yes. make sure that it's silky smooth on mobile we're phones. We're all we're all developers, right? So like we've got these beefy workstations with right. like gigs and gigs of RAM and yep. like sixteen cores, and you're like, oh, it's sixteen, awesome. Right. You get that on a MacBook Air, it's not going to run that well. Yeah. Um, so the rule of thumb here is always. Uh, optimize for the lowest common denominator of hardware that your application is expected to run on. Right. So, you know, I'll I'll wave my hands and kind of claim a rule of thumb, which is to say, if you're targeting mobile phones as well, like try and stay under 10 milliseconds. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's probably, probably a safe-ish bound. Yeah. And it's not a scientific measure, uh, but you know that that's a good target. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like the lower you can go, the better. But right. that's you know then the expressiveness of your application goes down with right. that, right? So you have to find that sweet spot, and I would say like 8 to 10. Yep. It's like, yeah, it's a good rule of thumb. Yep. But of course, with everything when it comes to performance, you have to measure, and you have to prove that you're still running at 60 hertz. Yep, perfect. So how do we measure All right, our OK, hertz? so well, that's going to bring us to the next one. The Just summary here, budget, and then track the performance across the project's lifespan. Yep. Don't just measure one day and then the week before release measure again and be like, oh, whoops, like we're, we're completely out of budget. Right. Um, really break it down. So I guess for, for frames, we do have the, uh, the timeline view in DevTools, right? We can hit record and it'll actually tell you how long uh, yeah. it took to yeah. render each frame, which is actually very, very useful. If you guys haven't tried that, I encourage you to, to try it. Uh, but I guess you can also kind of get a glimpse into that through Chrome tracing, yes. which is a yeah. much lower level view. But yes, it's very, very low level, um, but it's really useful when you really want to get down into the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. And by using the instrument instrumentation, you can actually like overlay your program's real execution flow right. with the larger Chrome context, which allows you to really see how you're fitting into Chrome's frame, because you're running within Chrome, and right. you need to understand the bigger picture. Yep. So with that, why don't we uh, try out a little experiment here? So I think you want to actually go oh. to the canary. OK, here, I'll let you. Uh, there we go. So we just have a different instance ah. here. OK, yeah, just a different instance. So what we have here is a very simple demo um, and some buttons alongside here. It's just a sphere that grows, and, a, and then it shrinks. OK. So when I press this button here, it runs at 60 hertz. If I switch to 30, it's hard to really see. Yeah, I don't really notice much difference. Yes, uh, but I, I will prove to you that it is, in fact, running at 30 okay. hertz. Uh, but a lot of you know film runs at 24, so the human eye is kind of conditioned. And mm -hmm. anyways, when you drop to 15, you yeah. really start to see it. Yeah, there's it's definitely a in there. And then when you go to 8, it's even worse. Right. So why don't we start at 8, and we'll just run a Chrome trace. So first thing is to figure out our process ID which in this case is 68139. OK. And then we go over to Chrome Tracing, and we record. And we pop over here, and we just let it run for a little while. Sure. We yep. come back. We stop the trace. So now we want to find 68139. I'm not going to collapse on everything else just right. for. So as we were saying, there's a lot of stuff on yeah, the screen, Yeah, I mean, right? just look at this, right? Like Chrome DB thread, Chrome file thread. Sure. Lots of stuff, but let's find where we live, which is right here. 68139, CD render main. This yep. is the thread where your JavaScript executes in. Right, OK. S 68139, comp center. This is where Chrome interacts with the GPU on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So you can see here, um, when we, I'll select this region right here. I'm pressing the F key, which zooms into what you have selected. And you can see that my I, I've instrumented the code and I've added a frame update marker, and we're spending 132 milliseconds per frame. So this is console time, time end for the frame update. So that, that's yes. you instrumenting it. That is me in, instrumenting in it. Okay. And you can see here that web view implementation colon colon update animations. Right. This is where WebKit says I'm ready to call your request animation frame callback. Interesting. Okay. And then we, so it's kind of strange. We actually have two different pyramids here. We have the first one here, which is run task, begin frame, update animations, V8 call function. Right. And then sitting on top, but still within the same thread, is our own hierarchy of, of right. markers. Right. So it, it goes from message loop down to V8 call function. 
and then we start overlaying our own. So we have frame update here, and I've added an AI update, which takes two milliseconds, a physics update, which takes two, and then a draw scene, which is just artificially taking a ridiculous amount of time. Right. So this is a very good visual way to get, like, e this allows me to very quickly see which functions are taking the most. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. Without even analyzing the numbers, it's just very obvious. Yeah, it's it's immediately obvious in this case. Draw scene is our bottleneck. Right, right. right. So this is for <coughs> a frame. Yes, right. it's for a frame. We're zoomed in. And so next to, oh, let me zoom out here. I've lost my keyboard focus. What happened there? Sorry, technical difficulties, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Probably easier just to re-record it. Yes, I agree. So here we go. Here's another frame. So stop. Yep. OK, there we go. Now let's go down to 68139. Press that and zoom in. So this so is a frame view. update. Yep. Next to it, we have this right here. And I know this just because I've spent enough time that when I've lassoed that that very tall tower there, yeah. you can see here that there is a call to draw layers. Mm -hmm. This is your clue that this is where the actual drawing occurs. Okay. So the first thing is you find your request animation frame, mm -hmm. and then you find this shape next right. to it. And from there, you can press G. And what G does is it's starting at the, the slice that you have selected, lays out uh, grids at 16 millisecond intervals. Okay. So you can see here that this is the start of our frame. So this is, at this point, we would be running 60. Okay. At this point, it would be so 30. So ideally, we should be seeing all of our work fit into each one of these small intervals. Yes. That's your yeah. 60 FPS. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So, so we're not going to we're, like, here. We're, we've completely blown our budget. So how many do we have? Uh, let's see, 60, 30, right? And then. Um, Something. I don't know. One, two, three, four, five. So when six, we recorded seven, it, I think it was 15 eight. frames per second, right? Yeah, or m yeah, maybe eight or something like that. Right, or so eight. We, we right, have about right. eight, uh, eight times 16, right. and we can see here that this whole thing is taking um, 133 milliseconds. Okay. Yeah, so we're so definitely getting less than 10 FPS. So this is your eight frames. Yeah, because you have a thousand. A thousand milliseconds, and we're spending 133. Right. Um, but I want to point out here that by clicking on the message loop run task, it will actually tell you the duration of that slice, mm -hmm. which is very helpful, right? Yep. You don't have yep. to like, we're sitting here counting grid lines when we could have just clicked. Right. Um, but you know what? So he here's a question. It seems so we're taking all of this time to just render, the, to draw a scene, right? Yep. But it seems like it's not even painting immediately either. Yes. It's waiting yes. a little bit, and then it's painting. So let me take another capture, which will even better illustrate this. Okay. So if we switch over to 30, which looks pretty much exactly like 60, yep. but it's not, um, let me take a recording here. So I'll just let it uh, do its thing, and then I'll stop the trace. And again, the first thing you do is you find 68139, which is down here. Yep. And then you zoom in. Yep. And you find that that shape. Yep. That so same shape again. right there. So that's there. the compositor thread just yep. working with so the GPU. Here we are at our request animation frame. And if we click on that, we can see, well, now we're our total frame update time is about 15 .3. So we're, we're actually just right under budget. Yes, and with that, you would expect to be running at 60. Yeah, I am. <laughs> but What's happening? Yeah, let's see. So I've gone ahead and I've selected our, our tower of drawing, yep. and we lay down the grid lines. And you can see that while here's the previous draw here, yeah. right? And if we s measure out, from one draw to the next draw on the timeline. It's taking 32 milliseconds. It's taking 32 milliseconds. So that's a dropped frame. Exactly. And when you really drill into it, you can see that while we, our code, executed well within the 16 millisecond boundary, right. Chrome's entire machinery takes a little bit of time to get it set up to execute our code. And then afterwards, in this specific case, what it's doing here is we've painted onto the canvas, and now it's actually flushing the canvas. So right. all of our paint operations are now being realized in memory. Mm -hmm. Following that, we have something called a commit stage. 
And this is where Chrome is signaling to the comp compositor thread, take the canvas pixels and upload them to the GPU. Right, yeah. When commit is finished, it's only at the next vsync that the draw will occur. Right, so we already <laughs> passed our 16 millisecond yeah. boundary. So at, at this point, Chrome just says, look, I'm just going to wait till the end of the next frame. Yeah, and that's really what it is. You are idle for like 14 milliseconds right. doing nothing. Right. While Chrome is like, all right, I'm ready to paint. Just tell me when the vsync hits, and I'll, I'll go. Right. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back here and we click on 60, again, you can't, I can't, my eyes can't tell the difference. Yeah. But Chrome can. So I've switched it to 60, and I'll do a recording here. I'll let it run. I'll stop. And here we are, down at the render thread. You start to get to know the colors. So I've got my uh, message loop here. So I find my I find my draw call, and it's not that one. It's over here. Here's a draw. You can see draw layers. Yep. So I pick that here, and I press G, and I oh, lay wow. down my 16 millisecond grid. Yep. So because my frame time in total it was only six milliseconds this time, yep. Chrome was able to run my frame update do all of its extra Change processing, fork, upload right. it to the GPU. Here's the, this is that commit phase again, yep, yep. where it's like realizing the, the requested changes I want to the canvas, uploading it to the GPU. Yep. But that is all finished in, well, we can click on this right here. About seven, seven milliseconds. Yeah, seven milliseconds. So we're well within our budget. And in fact, you know, coming back to our earlier point about mobile and different CPU and everything, yeah. right? This is probably what you want to see on your yes. app. If you're yeah. targeting if you've your got this silk, silk nice smooth. space here, that's great. Right. Because that means that if you happen to be running on a slower machine or a machine that happens to be bogged down, you've got room. Right. Yeah. What's interesting here is this guy right here is actually a input handle. Mm -hmm. It's a handle mouse move event. Right. So after the frame update, Chrome noticed that I had moved my mouse and notified the thread and said, hey, do any mouse move processing you have to right. do. I have none, so it just it bubbles out. Yeah, so this is a I think that's a great uh, highlight of like this is a very low level view. Yes, right? like yes. you could correlate. I press the keyboard, and um, this happened. Right, yeah. or I press the key on my keyboard, and this happened. That kicked off this V8 function, which did a draw call, and you can see a pyramid. Yeah. and now I'm over budget. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> or hopefully yeah, not. Yeah. And you'll see things like we saw with the 30 frames per second capture, which even visually, like, if you ask me, is that running at 60, I'd be like, yeah, of course. Right, yeah. I know I'm under 60 milliseconds. It looks as smooth. I can't tell the difference. Yeah. But when you really drill in, you can tell you're, in fact, not. Right. You, you're actually, like, your game update is at 60 hertz, but the rendering is delayed because you just tip over that boundary. Right. So you know what? I think this tool deserves at least several more episodes down the road, because I think it's, yeah. it's very interesting to no, just so look too, at different, actually, yeah. uh, different tools. So with that, let's see if we have any questions that we can answer. And we have a few. So the first one is, is it possible to capture and export this tracing data from outside of Chrome? So if I want to have it as part of build script or something similar. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Chrome tracing actually, as its file format, uses a JSON text file. Okay. So you can synthesize your own traces and upload them through the load button inside uh, Chrome tracing from any program, actually. I've okay. used it instrumenting my Direct 3D 11 game engine. Nice. I've written out a stream of JSON and then just loaded it in. You know, this reminds me. We actually had an awesome talk at Google I.O. Uh, about Android. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Generating a trace which you can import into Chrome tracing. So, so yes. you export your debugging or profiling data from your Android device, import it into Chrome, and use Chrome tracing to analyze yeah. it. I think uh, Project Butter used it extensively. Right. Yeah. Um, so this, this I think, is the, the Android profiler as well. Right. Um, Very cool. And furthermore, to this point, I've actually enabled. So Chrome tracing has an open source side project mm -hmm. called Trace Viewer, and you can just Google for trace hyphen viewer. And go there. And what I've added to Trace Viewer is a stream a support for streaming over WebSockets. Right. So you could have a web application hosting the Chrome Tracing UI, connect over WebSockets to some yep. server, 
and have the server be streaming live. Okay, so we're going to have you back okay, to talk yeah, about yeah. just that, because I think that's an awesome application. But I, I guess the, the, one of the highlights there is you can actually take the Chrome tracing stuff out of Chrome. Like, it's yeah. just a web app. Yeah, you yeah, just yeah. feed it data. Yes. So you can embed it in your own application if you want. Of course. Yeah, awesome. So next we have, so sometimes we made real-time uh, service with long polling. It's very hard for me to get a profile result of loading time. Do you have any suggestions for these situations? So maybe I can take this one. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so Chrome tracing may not be the exact tool. It may show you some network data. Uh, but you, what you probably want there is actually to use navigation timing data. Or what's coming soon is resource timing. So I think, I hope, fingers crossed, this will be in Chrome uh, 25. Uh, the idea is there that you, you'll be able to extract all of the TCP connection times, DNS times, and all the other metadata as you can today for your main page, the main resource page, for every resource on that you're making a request against. Mm -hmm. So you'll know exactly how long that page is taking, why it's taking so long, um, et cetera. So Chrome, tr or, so Chrome tracing may not be the exact tool that you're looking for, but there are the ways to get at that data. Interesting. Yep. Can I use sampling benchmark? Can I use sampling to benchmark my Chrome extensions? Yeah, I, th I think you can, right? Because from within a Chrome extension, there's some element associated with it, right? Yeah. And then from that element, you can bring up the Chrome DevTools. Yeah, so I, I believe Chrome extension just basically runs on the background tab. Mm -hmm. So you can open your about memory, find a PID, yep. and do the same thing. So console time, time end, and you should be. Yeah, yeah. You just put that in your extension code. Yep. OK. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting if I not only use this to improve my web app, but also to do a sort of regression testing on my server? Yes, absolutely. So I think this hints at um, kind of the automation piece, right? So yes. let's say we have this profiling code in, uh, well, it's there, right? And as part of our build, we actually log out some of this data and somehow yeah. monitor yeah. it and trigger alerts on it. Of course, right? Um, I mean, you can. From within Chrome Tracing, you can export the data. And yep. when you export the data, it's just a JSON file. So right. you could write any set of tools that you want that will process this and put it into a database and graph it for yep. you. And so I think we were talking about this just before the show, but I don't think there's a way to do that completely in, in, in a completely automated manner. Like you can't just tell Chrome, dump into this file. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it may be, but I'm not aware of a way to do it sure. either. Although that's something that I would love to have. Yeah, so maybe that's, that's a future request, I guess. Yeah. Uh, do the time and time end have the same matching name, or do they have to have the same matching name? Uh, yes. Um, so if you pass in time with foo, you pass in time end with foo to mark the end of that time region. Although you can have many uh, nested and uh, kind of overlapping time slices. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's that's it. So yeah. uh, we're actually going to post the slides as well on the uh, Google Plus event page. So take a look there. And if you guys have any follow-up questions, feel free to ping either one of us on Google+. Yeah. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you.